All right. Uh, now I have the unenviable task of introducing myself. <laughs> this is, I don't think I've ever done this before. Um, uh, we won't dwell on this, uh, but um, uh, many of you know me. I recognize lots of names on the check-in, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm a guy who's been involved in drinking water my whole career, uh, worked for water utilities and for consulting firms, uh, advising uh, uh, water utilities on how to continue to provide safe drinking water to their customers. Uh, in the last few years, I've gotten interested in water history and uh, started doing some blogging as well as uh, writing and uh, just finished uh, the book called The Chlorine Revolution, uh, Drinking Water Disinfection and the Fight to Save Lives. Um, uh, let's see, and then that has been published by AWWA. I just received my first copy. Uh, in the mail, and uh, it will be available for sale. It is available for sale now through AWWA and on uh, Amazon as well as other places. But I'm going to talk today about Dr. John Snow. And Dr. John Snow uh, did have a profound impact on water filtration and chlorination in this country in the early part of the 20th century. <clears throat> Speaking to you from Santa Monica, California, uh, it is a pleasure to be part of this seminar and to really get into a discussion of uh, how Dr. John Snow and the, the uh, experts in the middle part of the 19th century influenced what we did in this country uh, uh, in the early part of the 20th century. As you can see on the slide, uh, I have an outline that includes just a very brief introduction about Dr. John Snow. You've uh, heard uh, uh, in much more detail and in much better uh, English than I could ever come up with, uh, a description of Dr. John Snow, the man. But I, I will spend just a few minutes <coughs> talking about miasma and germs. Uh, there will be a much better presentation on that later on. And also spend just a couple of minutes talking about cholera, uh, a worldwide killer in the 19th century. I will move on to a very brief discussion of the Broad Street pump epidemic. Um, and then how all of that began to influence the development of filtration, first in England and in Europe, uh, moving across the pond uh, to the United States. Filtration was something that was added, but really the, the, be, the beginning of our ability to combat drinking, uh, waterborne diseases was with the chlorination of the Jersey City water supply in 1908, which I'm going to talk about towards the end of the uh, presentation. So let's, um, let me just show this slide, <coughs> pardon me. Uh, you've already heard, of course, that he was born on March 15, uh, 1813, to a family of limited means. Um, he did uh, take three apprenticeships in medicine. Uh, he was quite diligent in trying to learn his craft and, and the science associated with medicine. And in 1849, he was licensed by the Royal College of Physicians uh, after he'd been in practice for some time. And he became familiar with cholera, not by reading books. Uh, he was familiar with cholera because he dealt with it uh, with the epidemics of 1831 and 1849. Uh, he was a physician uh, who was caring for patients, uh, uh, sitting by their bedsides, and indeed watching as they died of this terrible disease. Besides uh, his interest in uh, communication of diseases uh, and how that all happened, he became, and, and as an excellent physician, he became known as an expert in the developing specialty of anesthesiology. Uh, this all developed right during Snow's lifetime. Um, it was first, uh, the use of ether was first uh, used in this uh, country, in the United States, and it spread across to uh, England, where uh, not only ether, but also chloroform was used, um, and he uh, actually directly applied it to hundreds and possibly even thousands of patients. Um, he would be called in as a specialist, indeed, by other doctors to uh, administer uh, this uh, really life-saving uh, uh, treatment so that surgeries could be performed on someone who was not awake. Uh, or also it eased the, as, as we know now, eased the a delivery of babies at the time, and as you've already heard, uh, he helped deliver two babies uh, from, that uh, Queen Victoria had uh, in the uh, 1800s. 
As a result of his experience with cholera, he published a very important uh, book or pamphlet, depending on how you want to describe it, called On the Mode of Communication of, Chlor of Cholera in 1849. And in that, he proposed that some unknown agent or particle in sewage contaminated water caused cholera when it was ingested. And so he was among the very few uh, people in uh, scientists and physicians and others who believed that you could, in fact, uh, communicate cholera from person to person. Uh, these people were called contagionists. Um, he was in direct conflict with the prevailing uh, belief at the time that bad air caused disease. The disease was spread by emanations from the earth, uh, weather conditions, and from the putrefaction of offal and human waste. It's really kind of hard to believe now, but um, uh, people really did believe that if you disturbed the earth, uh, you would release um, materials that would cause uh, disease and, uh, and devastate the population. I ran across one instance where they were not going to disturb the earth around New York City and lay a bunch of telegraph wires because they were concerned about releasing the emanations and causing disease in New York City. Uh, very famously, Evelyn Chadwick, uh, who was a, a reformer and someone very interested in um, public health at the time, uh, but was a believer, a firm believer in, in the miasma theory of disease, and his quote is, all smell is disease. Uh, of course, some smells are so bad that you probably think they would cause disease, but indeed, uh, that is not the case, and, uh, they, but they did believe it in the, in the mid-1800s. Snow was one of the very few skeptics of the miasma theory because of his very keen observations and his actual experience dealing with uh, cholera particularly, but also other diseases that appeared to be waterborne, such as typhoid and diarrheal diseases. Uh, we know that, uh, his, that the germ theory of disease, which was developed by Louis Pasteur, and others would not be um, uh, really developed uh, for a couple of decades later in the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, Dr. John Snow was a forerunner of uh, Louis Pasteur and really became uh, one of the proponents of uh, this, this concept of contagion that we pass it from one to another, one to another. Uh, you've already heard a little bit about cholera. Uh, it indeed was a worldwide killer. Uh, Pandemic means that uh, it is a, an epidemic that is so great that it uh, causes massive death uh, across a wide geographic scale. Most of these pandemics started in the Ganges River Valley in India and would spread north across Russia into Europe and then cross over to England and then through transportation cross over to the United States. Uh, the first one was in 1817 uh, because of improvements in transportation. Uh, and sometimes called Asiatic cholera was often fatal and could kill with a within a matter of hours. There are many stories of someone who was feeling fine in the morning and had died of cholera before the sun went down. The primary killing mode was uh, dehydration. Uh, cholera bacteria, once they attacked the gut, uh, began to uh, cause a very massive diarrhea resulting in a huge uh, fluid loss and that ultimately is what uh, kills the patient. Uh, the germ of cholera, Vibrio cholerae, was not identified and widely recognized until, again, many decades later after Dr. John Snow, when it was uh, published by Robert Koch in 1884. Everyone who has been involved in the drinking water business or public health has probably heard about the Broad Street Pump. Um, and we've heard a little bit about that from uh, uh, from Sandra, but uh, just to give you the facts, on September 3rd, 1854, uh, John Snow became aware of the severe outbreak of cholera in Soho, London, and one of the reasons he became aware of it was because it was literally a five-minute walk from his home. Uh, he took it upon himself to do what's called shoe leather epidemiology by going from door to door uh, in the Broad Street area and trying to figure out what the um, uh, incidence of cholera was and how it was uh, located geographically in the Broad Street neighborhood. 
And he came to the conclusion as a result of these interviews that the Broad Street pump was contaminated with this particle or agent that he didn't quite know what to call it, but he was quite sure that it was the source of the dread epidemic uh, in uh, Soho uh, in 1854. He uh, did not march out to the pump himself and remove the pump handle, which many of you have probably seen in some descriptions of this, but he did um, uh, convince the authorities to remove the pump handle on September 8, 1854, which didn't stop the epidemic, but it prevented a further epidemic uh, from occurring as a result of continuous uh, contamination of this, um, of this pump. Uh, we know now that, of course, the pump was put back in service a year and a week later as a result of the local citizens of Broad Street demanding that the pump be put back in service. It's hard to imagine, but indeed that was the case. Uh, many, many people don't know about Snow's greatest work, which was uh, indeed the forerunner of modern epidemiology, when he actually did a comparison of the disease uh, uh, incidences from two areas in London <clears throat> during the same epidemic uh, from water that was served by two different water companies, Southwark and, and, and Vauxhall, uh, which was a contaminated source on the Lower Thames River, and Lambeth, which was from an upland or purer source of, of water. Uh, the cholera death rates uh, were quite different between the two, and Snow was able to show conclusively that even in areas uh, where both were being served, which were e equal in, in uh, economic uh, uh, level of the, of the residents, that it was the water that was causing the disease and not uh, some miasma or contaminated air. So what does this have to do with the United States? We were faced with exactly the same problems as in London in the mid-1800s. In the late uh, 1800s, in the 1890s and early 1900s, waterborne disease were very common in the United States, and it was killing uh, the tens if not hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, rivers became more polluted in the United States as urbanization exploded. Uh, we had massive immigration to this country to fuel the uh, industrial revolution uh, that was occurring in this country, and uh, this concentration of humans really started to contaminate the uh, sources of supply. Everybody said, go for a clean upland source, but of course, those did not exist. And instead, um, because filtration was deemed too expensive and sewers were being put in and uh, central water systems were being put in, we found that we, we actually created, the engineers at that time created a very efficient delivery system for contaminated water to persons in the United States. There were very high death rates of diseases, uh, including typhoid fever uh, and diarrheal diseases. Cholera uh, had not really occurred in uh, the United States uh, after the uh, 1866 uh, uh, epidemic. It was controlled primarily by um, the quarantine. So uh, we had contaminated water sources. Um, there was a way of checking that contamination through filtration. Uh, the, the, in the UK, it really got started and proliferated there, but the US really adapted this very slowly because of the cost associated with filtration uh, and, frankly, the, belief, the, the, la the lack of belief that water was the source of the disease. Uh, we know that George Warren Fuller was very uh, instrumental in uh, the spread of filtration with his design and construction of the first modern rapid sand filtration plant in Little Falls, New Jersey in 1902. Uh, it was uh, this rapid sand filtration or mechanical filtration, which is what we use today. Well, what happened in Jersey City and why in the world did they chlorinate their water supply in 1908? Uh, it all began with a contract where Jersey City asked a private water company to provide a water supply that was quote unquote pure and wholesome. That's what it said in the contract. And indeed, this company uh, did uh, provide that water supply. It started uh, serving water from the Booton Reservoir, which was about 23 miles uh, due west of the city of Jersey City, um, and provided water, but uh, the city was not happy with the quality of the water and sued the water company because of the high bacteria counts in the water. And the judge agreed. He agreed that the water indeed did not meet the uh, 
requirement of pure and wholesome all of the time. Well, uh, enter in Dr. John Leal. Uh, he was a, uh, a man born uh, in 1858, uh, coincidentally, only 42 days before uh, Dr. John Snow died. Uh, his very short overlap with uh, Dr. John Snow's life and his, his career, I think, is an extension of many of the qualities that Dr. John Snow uh, showed during his lifetime. He uh, was a medical doctor uh, and attended Columbia, uh, graduated in 1884, and was sanitary advisor to several private water companies, including the private water companies serving water to Jersey City. Uh, after the judge's ruling, it was Leal's job to figure out what to do, either build sewers in the watershed or do something else. And he opted for the opportunity to do something else. And that something else was add what was then considered a quote-unquote poison to the water supply of Jersey City. And that meant the addition of chlorine in the form of calcium hypochlorite as we know it now, or at that time it was called chloride of lime. And he hired uh, uh, George Warren Fuller to design and build the chloride of lime uh, treatment facility, which uh, I'm going to try to uh, locate here on the slide. I'll circle it with my, there we are. Uh, that building uh, was demolished, unfortunately. The building to the left of it is the valve house for the, uh, the Booten Reservoir water supply for Jersey City, and that's still there today. Uh, you can actually visit that. So uh, in the second Jersey City trial, which was brought about to assess the viability of the use of chlorine, the judge ruled that chlorine was indeed safe, reliable, and effective. And this had just a tremendous impact on the United States. And what, um, what happened after that was an explosion of chlorine use across the United States. By 1914, 21 million people were being served chlorinated water. And then four years after that, the total of water served with chlorine in it was 33 million people. There just is not any other example of a water technology, a water treatment technology, that has been, uh, has been added to uh, water supplies in this country uh, that moved as fast as that. As you can see by this graph, uh, in let me see if I can get my, there we are. Yes, as you can see, by 1914, 53% of all people served by U.S. public water supplies were receiving water that was chlorinated. So this technology spread incredibly rapidly uh, throughout the United States. Oh my, looks like I lost my, uh, my graph. Oh well. Um, as a uh, surprisingly, as people stopped dying from, from cholera, I'm sorry, from, from uh, typhoid fever, uh, this link between uh, contaminated water and, and disease became very clear, and the use of filtration was also implemented uh, in a very big way uh, with a bit of a lag from uh, chlorination, but uh, they started, people, uh, cities started to filter the water and add this additional barrier to pathogens. Uh, Snow's lesson of keeping the sewage out of people's mouths uh, really did begin to take hold. And so what's the legacy of, the, of Dr. John Snow and filtration and chlorination? Typhoid fever deaths plummeted in the United States after the institution of chlorination, particularly, but also filtration. And uh, as you can see, by 1941, uh, the death rate for typhoid fever uh, became less than one per 100,000, which is generally regarded as... Um, the time when typhoid fever really disappeared from this country, and it's all due to the installation of chlorine and filtration. And Life magazine called uh, these technologies probably the most significant public health advance in the millennium, not in the century, but in the millennium. I've already mentioned that uh, I've, I've been working on a book, and the book is just coming out now, uh, which tells the story of Dr. John Leal and George Warren Fuller, and the story of Jersey City and the first use of chlorine. Uh, and it's something that uh, I've enjoyed very much doing, and I'm glad that uh, it's now available. And just to summarize then, as I run over my time just a bit, um, it's very important to remember that Dr. John Snow got us started on this road to providing safe drinking water 
by determining the connection between sewage and waterborne disease. If we didn't know this connection, we wouldn't know how to solve it. You know, we knew there was a problem, but we didn't know what the connection was between uh, sewage contamination of drinking water and disease. And so it's his contribution to our understanding of this connection which really made all of this possible. Cholera was caused by putting the germ into our mouths. In effect, we were eating and drinking excrement, which is a, a terrible thing to even compliment, uh, contemplate, but of course, that's in fact what was happening. And filtration and chlorination put two critical barriers between sewage and our mouths, just to, to put it rather bluntly. And for our li extended life expectancy, you can certainly thank an engineer for building that treatment plan and putting in the chlorination, but you also must must in, uh, thank Dr. John Snow. And thank you very much. Does anyone have questions for Mike? I see a lots of applause there. Great, Mike. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Aaron. <laughs> thank you, Percy. Yeah. I think Jerry <laughs> raised his hand. So if you have a question, Jerry, uh, you can either click on the microphone button or you can type it into the window. Yeah, Mike, can you hear me? I can. Um, thank you for that uh, interesting history. I have one question. Do you know if the, the public in Jersey City had concerns about the health effects from adding the poison chlorine? That's an excellent question, Jerry. And in fact, uh, Dr. Jo uh, Dr. John Leal was asked that question on the stand under oath uh, during the second trial by the uh, plaintiff's attorney. And uh, the answer was he didn't tell them. He literally did not tell them. He did this on, on his own, since it was a private water company. He added the chlorine, and they started uh, delivering that water before the citizens of Jersey City even knew that it was there. The interesting part about, of course, we can never do that today, but, you know, it's, a, it's it maybe foolhardy, maybe crazy to even think of doing something like that, but he was never criticized for it. That's what really amazes me, because once it was determined that chlorination solved this dread problem of waterborne disease, and people began to use it and, and get over their fear of chemicals, that he was never criticized for doing that, which I find extraordinary. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. That is an interesting uh, uh, historical perspective. Unfortunately, Jerry, we certainly couldn't do that today, could we? <laughs> We'd end up in jail somewhere. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Well, again, thank you all for your attention.